Welcome to the wonderful world of wine. We are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining Kim and I today on the wonderful world of wine. How are you, Kim? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself, Mark? Everything is good. Great. I'm excited. We have really probably one whole show here on three articles we find basically on interpreting wine buying of maybe inexpensive wines, Kim. <laughs> A couple of the articles said cheap. <laughs> People and our listeners know we don't like using that word cheap, we say inexpensive. The first article was in the Denver Post, and they said these wines are cheap and available everywhere, but are they worth it? So let's taste them and see how they are. (laughs) And it's basically supermarket wines that they say it's very convenient. They're out there. Everyone's buying them, but why are you and what are the better ones? Right. So, How good are they and are they worth it? And they started by saying that national brand support, or I don't know if they said it or I just made a note because I say it all the time, Kim, that national brands, we, we talk about that 90% thing. No, they made they, they made a point of saying that say in it? this article. Yep. I thought I was just that, repeating that myself. That a lot of there. these national brands are actually on a corporate level are owned by the same big company. So you might see the brand uh, that has its own label and it's sort of its own personality, whatever, but that brand is owned by a larger company and that there are a few of these larger companies that own most of the wine labels that you will see in a regular package store. And I'd like to just ask the listeners what they think of when they see, and I use this little logo a lot when I teach a class. And if a supermarket or a big chain is saying outright that we support big brands or national brands, is that a good thing for you as a wine consumer or is it a bad thing? And I always like to put that out there to people. And this is the example of bigger stores. They want to support big brands because they're getting support from the big brands and in different ways, but you're only seeing those wines. So then the article is like, well, they're out there, they're inexpensive. What do you think of them? What do we, what did we think of them? And they gave some really impressive numbers with like barefoot. Barefoot is sold, They what do they say, 675 million, was it cases last year? And Sada Home was 368 million cases. Big so, numbers. Yeah, it's huge, right? The top 20 brands are 4.14 billion in sales. So- Everyone is just buying them like crazy in, in the bigger store. So they mentioned Woodbridge Chardonnay, which I thought was a good one, Kim. Have you had Woodbridge lately? Not lately. No. Woodbridge is a Mandavi product and they sell like 1.1 million cases. And one of the things they mentioned was, you know, people see Chardonnay, but it's only 77% Chardonnay. And they made a point of telling people that, okay, well, you're drinking Woodbridge, you're buying Woodbridge, but keep in mind it's only 77%. And by law, it has to be at least 75%. So, so that's within, right. you know, that's within yeah. the law. It's within the law. And they're just saying, just be aware. But then they also came out and said that was one of the better ones they yeah. tried for Chardonnay. So mm-hmm. what was your take on the reviews? So I actually felt that the reviews were sort of in line with my own personal opinions for less expensive wines. And I would say that this really hit home when I was doing a tasting of boxed wines, like, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I guess, that white wines in the lower pricing tier overall show better than red wines. I think it is harder to make a good quality red wine at a lower price, sort of more of a mass produced commercial wine than it is for white wines. And I don't know if it's because of white wines maybe being a little simpler or red wines having just more complexity on a on a molecular level, you know, with all the tannins and with all this stuff from the skins. But I really have found in my own experience that it is a lot easier to find a good drinkable white wine at like, say, a I don't know, seven dollar price point than it is to find a red wine that tastes just as good 
at that same price price level. And that was exactly what they kind of came across with was that you can find some pretty decent mass market grocery store white wines at not a lot of money, $10, maybe under, but that red wines, it's really, really hard to find these big brand things at that price point. And something that they don't investigate in this article, but that we will talk about later in the show is about, well, and how do you find a wine that only costs $9, $10 a bottle that does taste good in the red wine category? So we will explore that later. Stay tuned. That's that's interesting because they mentioned the Woodbridge and Mondavi private selection for Chardonnays for whites. Yep. But then, as you said, for reds, they mentioned more imported versions of reds that they found were better. So was your interpretation that the United States big brands are not as good for reds, but the imported ones are good? Is that how you saw it? There's no... I think it's twofold. So I think that the takeaway is that... I. <sighs> I think part of it might be the cachet of California. So regardless of the price point, I think if a lot of consumers see California on the label, they're like, oh, California makes good wine. It doesn't matter how that wine is made. It doesn't matter what the label is, how broad. Right. You know. So, so on that, the California whites, you feel, show better than the reds. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I think okay. it's I think it kind of ties back. So we see from this article that their winners when it came to the Reds were all Chilean Cabernets. And I think it has to be stated that this only compared Chardonnays and then Cabernets and Red blends of a particular style. So they were really trying. Wait a minute. Am I getting them confused? No, that's right. OK, cabs so this is so the, they were doing cabs, and- Chardonnays, and then this this style of red blends that are on the sweeter side, because it they really did want to investigate the sweeter profile for red wines that has become very, very popular over the last few years. And the, the wines that showed best for the red wines were all Chilean cabs. And I think that this ties back to the cachet of place. And so a lot of American wine consumers, I think, are less familiar with the wines of Chile so you can get a better quality red wine for less money because it doesn't have that California on the label. The way they titled the article was they're available everywhere, but are they worth are they worth it, right? And then mm-hmm. they said these are the best, but they re- really didn't say, I would assume that meant it's worth it, right? If they were saying they're the best, because they didn't say use the thing again where they said they're worth buying. They just said these are the best we tasted. They never really said then we recommend Well, but I think the them. implication of the review of the wine is that, yes, it's worth it to buy this one. You know, if something is described as bright fruit of berries and cherries and quite refreshing, good with burgers, bargain, then yeah, that's we say right. is endorsing that wine. Like value, the value of this, you're going to spend nine bucks on a bottle of wine. This is worth it. Were you surprised that the... Chardonnay category did not include any like Kendall Jackson or St. Michelle or any of the big. Well, it, it did more... just they, they just rated them For lower. The best. Down. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised because you would think the Kendall Jackson maybe quality versus Woodbridge so because of I, the cost. Right. I have a sneaky suspicion that whoever wrote this article doesn't like residual sugar in their wines. Yeah. So or I or think they're getting that Mondavi money. Because I th- <laughs> they're all Mondavi products. Right? Were you going to bring that up later? <laughs> well, I mean, they did the best for all one, basically. Yes. Gallo. Okay. So, uh, you yeah. know what? I like your critical thinking. That's there what it is. looks like. Uh, an an okay. outsider looking in. Okay. So there could be two ways of interpreting this. Either this is actually an advertisement for Mondavi wines, or they really don't like any sweetness in their wines. And then anything that showed particular particular sweetness is completely going to be written off as them by them as not good wine because they don't like any sweetness in their wines. Right. But, mm, so I have to ask you, Kim, because obviously you go into a supermarket and uh, you know me, I always have this thing and I use that 90% number. Do you honestly feel when you're in a supermarket, I won't say any particular one, but when you go in a supermarket and they sell wine, do you look at the wines and say, big brand, big brand, or geez, I've never seen that. As a wine consumer and a wine educator, do you see that stat being real? 
that most of them are big national brands. It's hard to separate the two for me. I now cannot look at a shelf of wine and look at it like everyday consumer who does not eat, drink, and sleep the wine industry. So because does. you know because the I wines? know. Okay. Because I know But the I mean, there's always new, there's new brands coming out. So th- is there a time where you say, <gasps> oh, that one looks different? And then you pick it up and say, oh, yeah, it's Gallo or it's... I don't, I don't know. I mean, no? I would like to say that there is like a look to the labels of the big brand things, but I don't know that that's true. I I'm think it's, curious, I mean, it's out, hard you know, for us to know if a wine on a shelf is just a label, you know, that doesn't have a winery behind it, that is just a product that's been developed in a boardroom somewhere, or if it's an actual, like there's a family behind it, or there's a small business behind it, or there's a story and like real people, as opposed to just a corporation being like, okay, we're going to roll out a new flavor of coffee culotta this summer. You know, it seems like there are a lot of wines that are like that. It's like, okay, this year's new brand is going to be this. And there's some splashy presentation to introduce it to the market. It's really, I mean, it's, it's hard to, for us in the industry to know what is a market generated product and what is something with real people getting their hands dirty behind it, then I feel like it must be impossible for you, the wine consumer, to go into a store and know what is just a brand and what is these quote unquote real wines. Like, I don't even know what, what, uh, how do we differentiate? What do we call them? That's the thing I always struggle with because I I know am I being unfair to always kind of tell people that point when I'm talking about wine and say, be aware that the big brands dominate the space. But if we are the only ones always noticing that, is it worth telling people that, that this, the national brands dominate the shelving? Is, is it worth it? Am I putting a point out there that isn't valid? It's only valid because of people in the trade, not to the mm-hmm. average wine consumer. Mm-hmm. I always it's hard because it's so complicated too, because it's so many things about it that determine why somebody buys a particular bottle of wine and drinks a particular bottle of wine. Is it the label? Like that comes into play. I like to think that it's the flavor in the bottle. You know, first and foremost, it's do I like this wine? Does it taste good to me? And that opens up a lot of variables. So I might like this wine, right. but Which is it's a, a big, fine, you know, valid point. Brand. But I would like but, people to know who say that they like that style of wine. That there's ten percent other wines out there that are different in this, right. you know, in certain ways. Would you try those yeah. and feel the same way? And and I think that that you know it adds to the complexity of labeling, right? So you might like what is in what that bottle tastes like, and the label is understandable for you. You know, it's got a producer and it's got a grape variety and it tells you everything you think you want to know about that wine. And there might be something else out there from halfway across the world that tastes similar and is just as good. But if you can't decode what that label means, you're not going to pick up that bottle from a shelf. And even if someone is tasting it at a tasting for you, you still might be hesitant to take a taste of it. So there's all of those factors. And then there's the, what you mentioned about, is it a big brand? Is it a small, is it a small brand? Is it just a label? Is it a family thing? And then do they do right by the environment? Do they do right by their workers? You know, uh, all of these factors that (laughs) make wine buying so darn complicated. It's never easy. easy. We say that all the time. It's just, it's like on the one hand, it's just a drink. Right. And, you want it um, to taste good and you want it to go with your, your chicken parmesan. But on the other hand, and th- this is actually one of the things that I, I find the most wonderful about wine and why, frankly, I am in it is because you have that superficial level of, I just want something that tastes good. But then there is all of this other stuff that you can dive into. It's not just about the juice in the bottle and how does it taste. It's how it's made, who's behind it, what's the history, what's the dirt like, <laughs> you know, there right. are all of these layers, which is why people can get so riled up about wine is because it's not just 
a drink. It, it has all of this, for lack of a better word, baggage attached to it. And this is just one facet of it where you can have something that maybe is made by a really big brand and only costs, you know, short money, nine, ten dollars a bottle. But if it's pretty yummy and it's what you want to drink, I don't think that's wrong. Right. And a lot of our listeners are probably saying, you know, I don't know what Mark and Kim are talking about here. I, I shop and buy wines in the supermarket all the time. I have no issue. I right. like the wines. Yeah. And I think the way I can relate that back is I get a lot of feedback when someone walks in the store and they look and they say, geez, yeah, you know, can I help you? And they say, yeah, I, I really am not familiar with any of these wines. Yeah. And I'm like, I like that. I like to hear that. Because you don't carry a lot of a these lot of mass market. Yeah. Even I don't know a third of the wines you have on your stuff. I've tasted a lot of the wines. <laughs> so <laughs> on your shelves, re- relating but, that back yeah. to your experience when you're in the supermarket and you are looking, you say, you know, everything there, right? Pretty much. When someone, the average. But that's just consumer, me because I've been doing yeah. this for 20 years. So yes, I know all the wines that are on the shelf, but it's so different for someone who is an accountant or is a doctor or is a school teacher. You don't deal with wine every single day. So yeah, totally and different. That's the animal. same when they come into a store and they don't do a lot of big brands. They they're totally lost because mm-hmm. it's an unfamiliar world. Sure. Right. It's not seeing the same thing. So I just I I had to I don't know, get that point across mm-hmm. there. Just we look at it so much different and we have to understand the consumer, what they're looking for and how to explain that differences. So I, I just feel it's worth always telling the difference between national and smaller production all the time. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Kim and Mark. You can find more information about Mark on his website, franklinliquors.com. Please go shop at his store. And more information on myself at commonwealthwineschool.com. And as always, you can find our past episodes on SoundCloud and iTunes. So continuing our theme with our show today about less expensive value bottles of wine, we love sharing articles from vinepair.com. And today we have one that says, should I ever buy the $10 bottle of wine? And I think the answer is yes, but dot, dot, dot. Of course. <laughs> and this awesome. ties this ties into a comment that I made in our previous segment about being aware of the value of the wine that you are buying. So it's not necessarily about the great variety, but maybe you should take a look at where your wine is coming from, what region of the world, and search out wines from less familiar places because almost always you will be getting a better value bottle of wine for the price point that you're at if you are moving yourself away from either the trendy places or the trendy grape varieties. It goes back, Kim, always to what, can you afford? And, and what you like. Are, what can what you afford you like, and what do you like? What's your style? And we can help you find your style at any price point. We always say that. So if you like that $10 price point or the wine you always drink is $10, there is a lot of other wines out there in that price point. The problem though is it. what happens over the years, the problem is it's harder and harder to find the quality you used to find in a $10 bottle as the years go on. The prices are going up, so that $10 bottle is now a $12 bottle, and it's harder to find them, Kim. You go through this all the time. We taste so much, and you'll be thinking, I remember this was the best $10 bottle out there. Now it's 12 bucks, and it tastes horrible. That is such a great point to bring up because I feel like I have experienced that so many times over my years in wine that, you know, something used to be a particular price point or you go back and revisit it a few years later and you've been recommending it for years and you haven't tasted it in a while. And then you go back and like, oh my goodness. I think what is sort of tangential to this is that wine brands are bought and sold all the time and the brand may stay the same, but the wine in the bottle might end up being different. And right. and I, f- I feel like that's sort of a newer revelation for me, but is real. And that's at every price point this happens too. Mm-hmm. But nowadays things are really honestly increasing, just like gas, wine is going up a dollar, $2 a bottle, 50 cents a bottle. So 
we have to keep searching to find that price point to tend to bring things in. And there's a point where it's changed. It might change, but you, is it acceptable and still good quality? Before it was great quality. Now it's maybe right. good quality. And I can see why at this price point, it you know what I mean? The, to make a $10 bottle, it, it might not ever be that exceptional quality anymore. Mm-hmm. So, and, you and I think just with like inflation, you know, we've been always thinking about this $10 price point, but we've been thinking about the $10 price point for 20 years. Right. Exactly. You know, so exactly. what used to be a 20 is now 15. Yeah. It's, and that's, sorry, one did of I my, say 20? I meant 10. That's one of my pet peeves is that, you know, how can someone keep when prices are going up, keep it the same price just to keep it that price. It's not, it's, it doesn't make sense. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a strange thing in the industry, but you mentioned Kim, if you can't find, if it's a $10 California cab right now, you're drinking. In the previous article, we talked about inexpensive wines mentioned this. There are other regions of the world to seek out that you can now find that price point with the same varietal. So mm-hmm. in Cabernet is one of the, the big ones. Like you said earlier, Chile for ca- Cabernet, you can find under $10 values in Chile. It might be a little different profile or style than you like, but it's Cabernet, but it tastes just like it should from Chile and it's still good quality for $10. And it's this- always been this way. It's sort of always been this give and take between popularity of regions and quality for the price that you're paying for a particular bottle. So in, in a lot of ways, it's been that we sort of struggle with being able to give people bottles of wine that maybe are a different grape variety or are from a place in the world that people are less comfortable buying from. And it, I, I feel like I feel like Chile has been on everybody's radar for so long that it's not even the place to go for inexpensive bottles anymore. And I, 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 we've been talking for I don't know how many years about drink Portuguese wines. You know, Portuguese red wines are great value for the money and really interesting, but they don't have the grape varieties that people are familiar with. And I feel like those of us in the industry have been trying and trying and trying for so long, but we really are attached to this idea of grape variety. And if it doesn't say Cabernet on it, then people are so much less likely to buy it. In the article in Vine Pier, we're talking about really stressed, and it was a great point to look at other things. Look at Mm -hmm. Italy and the big EU producers, Italy, France, Spain, you can find some great wines for that, still that $10 price point. And they mentioned it in here, which I thought was great. And I think Italy recently is probably one of the better areas to seek out to find values. It always amazes me when you can get a $10 bottle and all it goes through to get here and the production and everything else and the quality that they're putting out at that price point Mm -hmm. compared to the California stuff. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree, Kim, but it's very hard to find the quality in a $10 California wine that you're getting from an imported $10 bottle. But the style is so different. And I think that that is what all of these articles sort of have in common is that, yes, those wines from Italy are great quality and are great with your pizza and blah, 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 but they don't have that big lush fruit that some consumers are looking for. They don't necessarily fit the flavor profile. So I I feel like- But Kim, do the California wines they're producing now have that anymore either? Big sweet fruit? Absolutely. You think it's still the quality, consistent quality that it was? Not quality. I'm talking flavor profile. Yeah, still the same. Yeah. I think it's all changing. You I think really the flavor do. profiles change? I just I do. I think it's just the fruit is not there anymore. Hmm. The sweetness. The yeah. sweetness. Yeah, yeah. The sweetness. But the fruit and the quality of at that price point lately is I think gone way downhill. But hmm. I, I can see what you're saying. If you made it sweet five years ago, it's still sweet. It, it kind of offsets right. it, it overpowers missing out on the fruit or whatever. So if you got a European bottle, it might be too fruity for you because it's a little drier. Yeah. I'm thinking that the dryness, I mean, unless you are 
used to it. Wow. Or if you're, if you're having it with food, they're fantastic. But I mean, even myself, every once in a while these days, I want to just have a glass of wine all by itself without having to worry about, is this going to go with whatever food I'm eating? And sometimes those Italian wines, as wonderful as they are, are not necessarily going to be the best for just having a glass of. All right. Now let's just briefly talk about this last article. I think it was in like a convenience store magazine article. Yeah, this was much more of a businessy, yeah, a businessy take on the situation. It was talking about quality versus convenience for beer mm-hmm. and wine sales, and mentioned during the pandemic a shopper, and we we talked about this a lot during the pandemic, that shoppers became more convenient. Or I'm only going to one store. I'm convenient shopping. I'm just Mm -hmm. buying whatever I see. And that's what I'm drinking because I don't want to go anywhere else. Run in, run out. Right. And they said one in five people, like 19%, buy wine based in a convenient situation. And I'm assuming they met from a convenience store. Is that? But I wonder if that includes a grocery store. That's what, what, yeah. It didn't say, but this is a retail association magazine, which covers, I think, supermarkets and convenience yeah. stores. Because I know that we've spoken in the past about not, I guess it does fall under the category of a convenience buy, but if you shop at a store that has a wine section and you're not looking for a specific bottle or brand, do you do your wine shopping when you are grocery shopping? And I think the consensus was yes on a lot of people's part. Even I said, you know, every once in a while, if there's Matt Trader Joe's and I need a few bottles of wine or I need some inexpensive bubbly to make a mimosa with, then right. then yeah, I'm going to pick them up there. So I, th- I think that that type of buying behavior ties into this as well. And I like to compare this, Kim. I like to say convenience shopping for wine is like shopping for food when you're hungry. <laughs> right? You just buy anything because you need it. Right. And then you get home, you're like, I bought this food, but I was I because I was hungry. That. I shouldn't have. And I think I, I'm thinking it's the same way with wine. Like, People, why did I buy these Cheetos? Right. I don't need all, to have these you know, Cheetos. I'm sure you've done it. I've done it. You've been somewhere. You just go to the convenience store and you, you're looking for wine and I'll just get that. Right. And you stick with it because you, you wanted a glass of wine and it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's these stats are out there. There was another interesting point in the article that mentioned the wine deliveries to your yes. door. People expect the convenience, 60 minutes convenience of getting wine delivered to your door. And there's been a lot of promotion. I, I watch sports radio a lot on the television because I'm always working. And there's been a lot of promotion lately for delivery of alcohol and say, oh, we'll get it there. And I think it says under 30 minutes or 40 minutes or something. Really? I don't even, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure who's doing, the, who's doing that delivering. That's the big uh, drizzly. Is it drizzly? drizzly? And, d- and big... how do they, how do they function? It's any retailer can join it and then you go on their app and order it. So it seems like consumers want it, but I wish they wouldn't tout it that it's going to get there right away. Like the Domino's thing, you know, 30 mm-hmm. minutes and they've had all these issues with young kids delivering pizzas and mm-hmm. trying to hurry up. There should be no rush or no need to get your in 60 minutes type of thing when you're talking the product that we you really need your bottle of Chardonnay in yeah. 60 minutes. I wish they wouldn't promote it that way. But I mean, that to me was related to this where it, it's all about convenience mm-hmm. now. Not only do I not want to go to the convenience store or the or the wine store or the supermarket, I want to just go on, pick whatever, and have it brought to me. So, but I I don't think that this is something that is specific to our industry. I think this is a sea change that we are seeing, and whether it's because of the pandemic or because of other factors in society, I think this idea of getting things at the click of a button right, on right. your phone or or whatever has just become something that is part of our society. Yeah, I'm showing my age, right? <laughs> but I mean, no, we're right. we're seeing right. this too. Where like you know, a lot of things are we're seeing this with sign up signs up for classes where it's a lot of last minute. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does make you from a business perspective, have to adjust your mindset when it comes to what consumers are looking for and 
being able to meet the needs of a consumer. Right. So I, I just think it's that's a great it's point. A, that, it's a you know it's a it's a it's change. A trend. It's, it's a change a and it's a trend to, in right. our society, and it's something that needs to be grappled with from all aspects. I feel that this last article talking about convenience brings it all back to the first article talking about the value. Is it worth buying, you know, yeah. the value of the big brands right. when you're in a supermarket? Because it's convenient. It's always going to be convenient. So why would they want to stock anything but a big brand? Because they can get it easily. They get supported. There's enough of it out there. People know it. Why mess around with the little guy? Yeah. What what's the what's the need, right? But then there's always going to be that back and forth between that, you know, quality and convenience and is it worth it for you, right. the consumer, to go the extra mile to get that special bottle, like we spoke about last week. And what is that value? Is there something about getting a more special bottle when you know a little bit more about wine and it's not just buying that convenient bottle, but there is something more to it for you. And so if that increases your level of enjoyment and appreciation and your quality of life, dare I say, by yeah. having that special bottle of wine, then it's worth it to you to not buy it at a convenient, necessarily convenient store because you're looking for something more and something different. So all of those factors, I feel like come into play. Yeah. And we'll just keep trying to figure it out, Kim. We'll keep watching and talking about the trends. And That's right. Try to figure out what uh, is hot for consumers. And and the nice thing about wine is that it always changes, whether it's the vintage or whether it's the trends or whether it's where you can buy your wine. So we are always here for you and uh, and and keeping our eyes on what's going on in the world of wine. Thank you for listening to us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Please feel free to leave your comments or questions and we will perhaps answer them on the show. You can listen to us on Franklin Radio 102.9 FPR every week. We are there with new episodes and you can find us on Twitter at Wine Education. And so follow us on our social media. Cheers. Bye, bye, bye.